So, you know, uh, one of the things that um, I want to encourage us is that I believe that God wants to do something every time we gather. Do you believe that? And uh, last week, Danny and I had such a good time with our conversation going back and forth. So today, um, I'm, I have the privilege of introducing the next series, and it's uh, of The Life of David. And we, when we were thinking, what are some things that we need to be reminded of? And so each week, and over the next few weeks, we're going to be having something that God wants us to know about. So today, my topic is learning to lead. So, Lord, as we come before this, Lord, again, my hope is that we don't, I don't talk at people. But, Lord, that I invite all of us into a dialogue in our hearts about how does this apply to me? How does this apply in my life? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, when we were uh, talking about what we were going to call this series, uh, one of the things that we said, well, we talked about, well, a man after God's own heart. But then the problem is, is that if you're not a man, what do you do with that? And uh, again, the whole idea about man, it has to do with a person. So a person after God's own heart. So um, my grandfather, my mom's dad, uh, he was a very wise man. And uh, he looked at me one day and uh, he said, Tommy, he said, if you please to please God, you can do anything you please. So let me say that again. He said, if you please... To please God, you can do anything you please. So if your heart is inclined towards God, and that's your heart, so then the desires of your heart will be in line with the things that God wants you to do. So it's kind of like, hey, God, um, uh, it's on my heart to help someone. God says, you can do that. That's my heart. Well, it's on my heart to pray with someone. Well, that's my heart. And so it's interesting um, that this is in the book of Acts. It says that David was a man after God's own heart. And I thought to myself, what a great thing to be said of another person. That, boy, would somebody say that of me? Boy, you know, taught me that he's really a person who has a heart after God's own heart. Now, you might say, well, that sounds kind of ridiculous. Because if you know anything about this, the, um, the life of David, he was not a perfect individual by any stretch of the imagination. But the one thing that cons was consistent about David is his heart was inclined towards God. So when he failed and he did, he didn't excuse it. But when God f got into his head and says, David, you've done this, you've sinned, it's a sin, you need to repent. We see that, he, that David made the right responses. It wasn't perfection but it was his soft heart towards God. Now, um, I don't know about you, but my experience is, is that just about everything in life is out to harden my heart. Circumstances, what people say, what people do, and even when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, and I said, I don't want to hear that, every time you say no to God or not right now, that that's all part of that hardening process. And so what's happening is God's constantly wanting to make sure that our hearts stay soft and tender before him. Now, would you agree with me that life causes your heart to get hard? Because we think that that's the only way we can protect ourselves. And God is saying, let me protect you. Now, one of the things that was a differentiation between Saul and David was that David was a man after God's own heart, and he was obedient. One of the things about David's having a heart after God was he was obedient. And I was reading in the next one here is in Samuel 7, uh, 13, verse 14. God, when, when Saul didn't do what God asked him to do, God said, I am removing you from the kingship, and I'm going to put in place a man who has my heart. So one of the ways that we can encourage a soft heart is just be obedient. It's as hard and as simple as that. And so Uncle Jerry Cook used to say, all you have to do is make the next right choice. And when you make the next right choice, then the next right choice becomes more obvious. And you keep just following the choices that God is putting before you, which requires a soft heart. Now again, 
I grew up in an agricultural community, and I wasn't a horse person, but my friends had horses. And one of the things about a horse is that, that you had a horse that had a soft mouth. And if you know anything about a bridle, they put a bit in, in the horse's mouth. And again, if that horse has not been abused, that horse, just the slightest pressure on the rein gets that horse to do this or that. But if somebody's always yanking and yarding on that, the horse has a callous mouth. So the reality is, is that we want to be people who are under the control of the Holy Spirit and obedience. <clears throat> now, again, this is an old King James word. And you say, oh, Tom, you know, that's so goofy. Well, we were in this group of pastors on Thursday, and we were talking about feedback, and we were talking about listening to, to what people have to say and listening to the voice of God. So, of course, I grew up with the King James, and I said, we need to not only hear, but we need to heed. And heed means obey and do something with it. <clears throat> so somebody at the, 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 uh, the table said, oh, that must have been Tom. And I said, yes, that was me. So what happens here is that we need to see, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Now again, this is another one of those scriptures, electronically or in your tactile Bible. This is one of those scriptures that you should have marked. In fact, this is one of the very first scriptures that I ever memorized as a child. And so I'll put it in context. So God wanted Samuel to go to Bethlehem to, and that he was going to anoint the, the king. And so Samuel went to Jesse's house and he saw all of these big strapping young men, good looking, athletic, tall of stature, bearing. And so when Eliab, the oldest, came, Samuel looked at him and says, oh my goodness, certainly this must be the king. And so no, God says no, and then went all the way through that. And so Samuel, by this time, he's saying, what's going on here, God? I would have chosen any one of them. And this is what God says in verse, in verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we thought about calling these life lessons from David. But one of the lessons from today is that God is saying he doesn't see things the way that we see things. For we look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So now here's like a practicality here. Have you noticed that everybody's different? And what I think is funny, most people don't. And I'm okay with that. And I have grown used to eyeballs being raised and our eyes being rolled. And it's really unfair when somebody says, well, that person's not worshiping. You know, maybe you're a really emotive person and you're standing on your chair and at the top of your, like, ah! and another person's like this. Well, the reality is, is that it isn't what's going on in the outward. God looks not on the outward, but God looks at your heart. So the lesson here would be, if that's how God looks at things, that's how we need to look at things. And so again, just so you know, I'm so grateful for our, our human worship leaders. And just for the record, I don't check their, their list. I don't call them up and say, these are the songs that I want you to sing. Have, have you just noticed that every week, they just kill it. They hear from God, and the songs are just exactly what it says. It says, even when I don't see it, God is working. That's who you are. Even when I don't feel it. So what's happening here is as we work our way through this, God looks not on the outward appearance of things, but he looks on the heart. So if you say, well, well, David messed up. Well, yes, he did. Well, he can't be a, a, a lesson of leadership. Yes, he can. Because God didn't look at his mistakes. God looked at his heart. So that's something that will run through this entire series. So, um, so I have some, some alliteration here. I was pretty, pretty pleased with this. So the first thing I want to say is that the first thing we want to say is that David was learning to lead. Now, if you notice, it didn't mean that all of a sudden he knew everything what to do. And when you're learning how to lead, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And so my dad used to say he was the king of the one-liners. And he would say... You know, how do you keep from making mistakes? Experience. 
How do you get experience? From making mistakes. So what we see here is that David was learning how to lead. Now you might say, well, you just lost me, Pastor, because I'm not a leader, and that's a lie. Every single person in this room is a leader, even if you are only a leader of one. Yourself. Self-leadership. All leadership begins with self-leadership. And leadership is to learn to lead. You also have to learn to follow. So I was thinking about David this week, and, you know, I didn't go back to an old sermon and kind of rejig it. I said, God, I want something fresh. So I was looking at this. So first of all, David learned to lead by looking after sheep in obscurity. That's a big word, which just means nobody saw what he was doing. Now, my dad used to also say a lot more would be done for the kingdom of God if we weren't so concerned about who's going to get the credit. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I say, Lord, I've been faithful, and, and it doesn't seem like anybody knows all that I'm doing, and he's up there saying, but I do. And so the reality is, is that it's not about who gets the credit, it's about being faithful. And so David learned something about leadership because he learned to be faithful in the sh dealing with sheep in obscurity. Now, let me tell you something about sheep. My, my mom's people, they are farmers, and they had sheep. And my great uncle, John, Johan, he said, <clears throat> sheep are stupid. And if you've been around sheep, you can see that. They're just clueless. Now, I didn't say you're stupid. I said sheep are stupid. But I think it's interesting that God calls us sheep. And that's that we need help. We need to be taught. We need to be led. We need to be, be there in relationship. And so David was faithful, serving in obscurity with a bunch of sheep. But God was teaching him something about leadership. Second thing is that we see that out of his leading in obscurity, he was learning responsibility. And my dad used to say, if you do a lot with a little, you get a chance to do a lot with a lot. And my dad would say, if you're not master over the few things, you may be something over the many, but you will not be master. The next thing we see is that he was honing his skills with a sling and a harp. He learned about effort and development. So I, I, I stand in awe of, of the musicians that, that, that are with, that serve us so faithfully every week. And, and I've, I've taken lessons for years. And all I know is, is that, that all of what we see and what they seem to do so effortlessly, they just didn't come out of the womb playing a guitar or a piano or a bass. But what happened was there was hours and hours and weeks and weeks, months and months, and years and years of do 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 And you know, I I bless my mom. I was in a band, and I it it was a very good high school band. But I remember she would sit there and she would listen to me honking and and just you know squeaking and whatever with my trombone and and whatever. And I just remember, and she was such an encouragement. Oh, son, that was so good. <clears throat> but you know what? If I hadn't have been making all those mistakes and, and, and blatting all over the place, blah, 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 you know, it would have never been something that would have been making beautiful music. So David learned faithfulness. He learned something about effort and development. So if you want to be used by God, <clears throat> It's not that your effort will impress him or somehow make you worthy. But the reality is, is that Paul writes to young Timothy, he says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, learning how to lead, including leading yourself. It takes effort. So he honed his skills with a sling, which would come in handy. And he learned to play the harp. He wasn't sitting around saying, I'm bored. So my son-in-law, Josh Muir, who also is quick with words, one of his kids said this, I'm bored. 
okay, parents, have you ever heard that one? I'm bored. And so Josh's res- response to one of his ch- child, the children was this. He says, only boring people get bored. Find something to do. Now, don't use that on your kids because they'll probably get mad because that's what happened. <laughs> <clears throat> but the question here is, is that David was learning to lead that he understood the gift of time. That he wasn't sitting around being bored. But what happened was, is in those times, he learned to get quiet before the Lord. And you read the Psalms, and you see the great deep insight. And the great deep insights that he had was not because he was preoccupied with things that didn't matter, but he learned the secret of listening to the voice of God. He learned to lead. The second one is that he was serving to succeed. Now, again, um, that this, is, this doesn't work anymore because we don't have radio stations very much, but everybody's favorite radio station, now you can listen to the radio over the internet, but everybody's favorite radio station is WWIFM. What's in it for me? And so what happens is so often people are saying, but you're not serving me, you're not meeting my needs. But there's something about being the person that God can use that learns that it's not about you. It's about learning to serve. So David served his father. He took care of the sheep. His other brothers were hanging out with dad and they could see all of the things or the father could see all the things he was doing. And David was out on the back 40 taking care of a bunch of sheep. But he learned something. He served his father. And so obviously his father must have known that he was responsible because when it came time to find out what was going on at the front with the Goliath situation, that Jesse said, David, I want you to go and find out about your brothers. Come back and report to me. Take him some cheese. Take him some milk. Take him some food. Then I want to find out. So he sent him. So he was responsible. He served his fathers. He served his brothers, even though his brothers were hard on him. So if you read in 1 Samuel 17, and that's your homework for today, this week, reread again the story of 1 Samuel 17 about David and Goliath. So David shows up, and he's poking around, and he's there to find out what's going on. And so he sees this big giant shooting his mouth off, cursing God and whatever, and saying, you know, look, come, and I'm a champion. I'm a Philistine. Come and take a piece of me, and I will throw you to the dogs, and I'm going to eat you up and spit you out. Come and get me, because your God is so weak. And so David says, who's going to do something about that big mouth? And the older brother says, you, what are you doing? Why, why have you left those few sheep in the wilderness and you think you're so cool? And David says, I don't think, this is the TG paraphrase. He says, I don't think I'm cool at all. All I know is I'm not going to stand by and watch that big mouth take on the armies of God. He served his brothers even though they didn't appreciate it. So the reality is, is who are you serving? And are you saying, Well, I want somebody to recognize what I'm doing. Well, they're not very nice to me. They're mean to me. David didn't matter. He served. And then he served King Saul. We'll learn more about this next week. The title is Submission and Authority. And that's a really big issue. You all need to be here. I need to be here. Because there's something about learning to be submitted and understanding godly authority. That's all part of obedience. So King Saul was not a nice guy. And the more David served, the more jealous, the more jealous Saul got. Until finally, you know, David's just there serving in, in the court of Saul and he's playing his harp and, and, and Saul was so mad, he picks up a javelin, a javelin and he hucked it at David and trying to pin him to the wall and David escaped. So service isn't something that, well, they deserve to be served. Service is all about, am I going to do what Jesus wants? And Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Now, again, I'm not picking on any of you. We're just trying to have a conversation here. But we sang a song about purpose. And uh, let me tell you one of the things I'm observing is our world is becoming increasingly more self-absorbed And people are becoming increasingly more lost. I think it's because they have forgotten the fact that it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about helping others. 
And I've watched that when people are serving, that something of value and, and purpose is excited in them. And there's a sense of value because that's what God wants us to do. The next one was there was the testimony of transformation. So in, in Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, when Samuel anointed David, this is what it says. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. In power. And it's interesting that as, as you, you read through in, in Samuel 16, verse 18, here's what it said. It says, one of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking young man. And the Lord is with him. So this isn't about trying to beat you up or whatever, but David, that when he was walking in his anointing, in his calling, we talked about that last week, people noticed. And they could tell that something had happened. So here's my question, and this is applying to me. When people have interactions with you, when people have interactions with me, are they saying of us, they're brave, they're strong, they're well-spoken, and something's different. It's the testimony of transformation. The next one, notice all this alliteration. I was just really happy about this. The next one has to do is that he had faith to fight. And now that brings us to 1 Samuel chapter 17. So there's a couple of things here that we want to talk about. First of all, David was under no delusions that he could win this battle in his own strength. And if you read through the scriptures and if you look at your own life, you will see that there are lots of times where you think you can handle it only to end up in defeat. And it's kind of like, God, where were you? And God says, I didn't ask you to fight that battle. And so we see in, in, in 1 Samuel 17, 47, that David had no delusions. The battle, he knew the battle was the Lord's. So young David comes up to see his brothers. He sees this foul-mouthed, cussing, spitting, grunting, big nine-foot-six guy take it on the armies of Israel. And he says, that's not right. Who's going to do something about that? And when he said, nobody's going to do it, he said, this is not my battle. This, this battle belongs to the Lord. You're going to have battles. Like you say, duh. <laughs> the reality is that you're going to have battles, but what happens is we need to remember that the battles aren't ours, they're the Lord's. And past victories provided faith and courage. And so David said, I'll go fight this guy. Because God is with me and he's not going to allow his name to be forsaken. And so what we see happen here is David said, well, he said, well, who are you? And he says, well, I was taking care of my father's sheep back on the backside, the back 40. And he says, God delivered me from the hand of the bear and from the mouth of the lion. The same God who helped me overcome the bear and the lion is the same God that's going to help me take out this giant. Past victories provide faith and courage. If I never had a problem, I never know that God could solve them. And he, he used what he knew. So when Saul comes, says, David, here comes David, and the Bible says that he was, the Hebrew word here is he was a na'ar. And you say, who cares? Well, I use that word because a na'ar was not a little boy. So, you know, in Sunday school, it says only a boy named David, only a little sling, only a little boy named David. But he could play and sing. Those are the things I remember from Sunday school. So we often see this little scrawny, little eight or nine-year-old kid. Put against Goliath with my little slick shot. But he was, he was a young man. So he's probably somewhere in his teens. Now, again, if you like hockey, which I do, 
you know, you notice that when the guys first break in, you know, especially the young ones, they're 18, 19, 20, they're quite scrawny. And what's the one thing they say, yeah, he's really good, but he's got to put some meat on him, you know. And then by the time they get to about 25 or 26, they're kind of fully developed. Well, so, so you see, David was probably about 16. And he wasn't a little boy, but he wasn't yet fully in his... But here we are. So Saul says, well, you got to have some armor. So Saul says, come in. And so Saul was a big guy. He was a head and shoulders taller than anybody else. And so they said, give David my armor. So I have this picture. Here's this young Na'ar, this young man. And he's just weighted down, and he's wearing this armor of this big dude by the name of Saul. And he says, I can't fight in this stuff. I don't know it. So what he does, he goes back to what he knows. So he goes back to his sling. Now, there's a place in the Bible that says that, that these guys were, were, were ace shots. I mean, these guys, it wasn't like, oh, I hope I can be lucky and hit the bullseye. But he was out there practicing, just like he was practicing his harp so God could use him. He was practicing with a sling. And it says these guys could hit a hair's breadth from 50 paces. So what happens is he takes his sling, which he knows, and he takes five rocks. And somebody says, why did he do that? Did he think he was going to miss four times? No. Goliath had four brothers. He was prepared. And so he used what he knew. And he said, when, Saul, when the Philistine says, am I a dog? You're going to send this little guy out here? I'm going to feed you to the, to the birds of the field. And so David says this, and I have it memorized. He says, you come to me with sword and shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. So a couple of weeks ago, I wasn't beating up on any of you. I remember I said, let's not be flippant about using the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is not an expletive and it's not a name when something good happens or OMG. But we need to preserve the power and the integrity of the word of God in his name. And so David said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The next thing is that there was this balance between skill and character, and, and I'm just about done. I couldn't make this rhyme or have alliteration here. Sorry about that. But in church, when we talk about leaders, historically, churches are very bad about elevating people with skill over character. He can sing, he can preach, he can play the guitar or the piano or he, he's eloquent or whatever. And, and what happens is this, and nothing has contributed more to the barrenness of the church of Jesus Christ than people who are gifted that have skills without character. So part of this leadership quotient is that skill without character will always blow up. Always. It may take till you're 70, but at some point in some way, it's going to blow because I've watched it over and over again. So I'll tell you an illustration of this. Um, you know, in the 80s, the Germans had a corner on, 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 on diesel engines on, in cars. And so this was before Tesla and, and electric cars. And so what happened was the the, the North Americans, General Motors, they said, oh my goodness, we got to make a diesel engine car. So what they did, and this is beyond my, my engineering and physics, but I think you'll get the, the picture. The compression in a diesel engine is like over double what a normal gas engine is. So everything has to be stronger. The block has to be stronger. That's the part that the pistons go up and down in, all of the seals. So the, the, the G General Motors people, they took a gas engine block and they tried to beef it up to be diesel. And it kept blowing seals. And it was a disaster. That's what I'm trying to say. The character is the block and the seals. And skill is the power. And if you don't have character, you'll blow up. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. But one of the things that you'll... So we, around here, if you talk to any of the people that work with me, we talk about this a lot. Character and skill. And I will take a person with character that has lesser skill over a person with more skill and less character. 
But character is something that can be developed. And David was learning all of these things by what we talked about. So here's a list. I made a list. Say, well, what skills? Here's some skills that I saw. First of all, he was good. He, he learned the skill of overseeing resources. He oversaw the resources of his father's sheep. And then in the early days of his relationship with Saul, Saul would release warriors and stuff into his care that David was kind of Saul's go-to guy before he got jealous. David had the skill of proficiency with a sling that he had honed. He had a skill. And so let me just say that when he was slinging that thing, he's home, dear Jesus, help me, or dear God, help me hit that guy. He was saying, Lord, I've done this a thousand times when it didn't matter. Now it matters. Make sure that my aim is true. He had proficiency. It was a skill. He had the skill of playing the harp. And so when he played, not only did he, was he a good musician, but he had a minstrel gift. When he played, the spirit of the Lord moved. And that's what I pray for all of our musicians. Those of some of you are sitting here in this row. I pray, pray for you guys all the time. I say, I don't want you to just be good. But I want you to have that minstrel gift that when you start to play, that people are drawn into the presence of Jesus. And I think that, you know, you know what I'm just saying? Like, I've been, and I've been to, to church services, and boy, it's like it's a great Las Vegas show, but it doesn't have much of the Holy Spirit. People are just amazing musicians, but it's like, oh, that was a great show, but where was God in all of that? We want people who have that character that goes with the skill. Here's the character things, and then I'm done. Part of David's character was he had a heart for God. He wasn't perfect. And occasionally he got off. And in one, at least one place, he got off big time. Committed adultery and murder all at the same time. And yet God still used him. Now, I'm not saying that was okay. Lottie's going to be covering that later on in the, in the series about stewarding families. And you'll want to be, she's just such a great speaker on the stuff like this. But the issue was he had a heart for God. He was a servant. He is a person who was full of faith. He persevered. And lastly, he trusted in God and not himself. And Dennis, you want to just come up and you would. <clears throat> He's going to play for me. Thank you. So I want to ask you this as we start to wrap this up. <clears throat> understand the balance between skills and character. And the last slide there, Liam, if you put it up. So what about you and what about me? You know, I, I want you to know that I, I take what I do very, very seriously. I prayed over this. And God, I just want to communicate what you're communicating to me. I want to live with this. So what about you? Where do you fit on that in this message today? Are you allowing God to teach you and, 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 and hone your leadership skills? Are you willing to serve in obscurity if no one ever knows what you do? If God is asking you to do something, are you willing to do something? Just show me his mom there right there. Next question is, are you teachable? Are you obedient? Are you, what, what about that? But I want you to know that I'm not standing up here. When I was reading through this, I said, God, I don't want to just talk about this. But I asked myself all those questions. What about you? What about me? We talked last week about how everybody has a gift. Everybody has a calling. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a meaning. My hope is in this series on David that we'll have some practical stuff. So you close your eyes. First of all, so I can say I do this every every week. I, I'm, I know all of you and I'm sure all of you have made a decision for Jesus, but I want to be able to say I do this every time. Maybe you're here and maybe you know about Jesus, but you have never made him your personal savior. Maybe you're here at what for the first time or you've been here a thousand times but you need a personal relationship with Jesus by raising your hand that gives an opportunity for me to pray for you or you're saying 
Jesus isn't just somebody that existed. Yeah, he's God, but he's my God. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. So anybody like that by raising your hand, I would love a chance to pray with you. Anybody? Okay. So where are you in this whole leadership thing? And I want to come back to the songs that were chosen by our our human worship leader this morning by the power of the Spirit. I've been around a long time and so many people struggle with the damaged self-esteem. And they say, well, God can't use me. God's used David. You're a leader. You're a leader. Even if it's just leading yourself. I just want to pray. If you're here this morning, nobody's looking around. I want to pray for you. You say, you know, I just feel so damaged. How can God use me? How can God use me? I want to pray for you because that's a lie from the pit of hell. God wants to use you. If that's you this morning and you just need to know that God really does have a plan for your life, that he's, he loves you too much to leave you where you are, I want a chance to pray with you. Is there anybody like that? Yeah, thanks. I see that hand, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, see that hand too. Yeah, I see that hand too. Lord, we're serious about what you want to do through us as a church and as individuals. And so, Lord, is these people, they feel so damaged. It's so, 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 it's so hard for them to keep their heads in the game that you can use them. But Lord, for these precious people who raise their hands, Lord, I pray, God, that you would once and for all settle that score that you have a plan for their life and that they are a leader, even if it's leading, being a leader of one. If they're married, they can be a leader to their spouse. If they're, if they're a, a father or mother, they can lead their kids. So Lord, I pray that you would help them in Jesus' name. Bill, else, again, I want to pray for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, you know, Pastor Tom, I want to just covenant with you that I have not really been a good steward of my time and my talents. <clears throat> but seeing what, what God asked of David, with God's help, I want to change that. It could start today. If you're here, you see, Pastor Tom, I'm just going on record. Pray for me. I'm choosing, I am choosing to steward my leadership. Is anybody like that? I want to pray for you. Okay, yeah, I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, Father, there are so many things that clamor for our time. There are so many things that clamor for our attention. Lord, things that though not in and of themselves are necessarily wrong, but if they're keeping us from developing what you want to do in us. Lord, I pray, God, for this people who've raised their hands, Lord, that you would just help them starting today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The next part is this. You don't come to church to get beat up or criticized, but if, I just feel that some of you, I hope that it, the, the message really got through about character. And I want to pray for you. If you're here and you would say, Pastor Tom, I just covenant together about about allowing God to shape my character, <clears throat> that I need help with that. I, I recognize that, that that's been a weakness for me, but I'm going to start today. I commit myself anew and afresh to allowing Jesus to, and his Holy Spirit to build character in my life. Is there anybody like that? I'd like a chance to pray with you. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. <clears throat> Lord, I've said that this countless times from the, this platform, that if we could help ourselves, we would, but we can't. Lord, for these that have raised their hands, God, in the name of Jesus, I stand against the accuser of the brethren that would, would try to beat them up and, 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 and remind them of their failings. Lord, I pray that the, that the accuser of the brethren would be silenced and that the voice of your Holy Spirit would say, child, I am going to shape you into a vessel for honor. I pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, we can't do it in our strength.
we echo what David said, that the battle belongs to the Lord. And I don't come with human effort, but Lord, we come in the name of the Lord. I pray this, I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Well, you want to stand with me then? <clears throat> Can I just encourage you this morning? I have such hope. God is shaping us all for great things. And I want to just let you know that, and I close with this, that I'm, I've been praying to the Lord, I'm prepared and I am walking off my known map. And so we're experimenting with some things. We're doing some things differently in, in how we gather. And, you know, I just know that God is asking us to lay down what we know for the unknown. And I don't know all that that means. But I just want you to know that I'm asking you to walk with me as we learn all that God has for us to be everything he wants us to be. So Lord, I just thank you and praise you for our time together today. And that you're gonna, as we go from this place, that Lord, it isn't just that we spent time in a building, but we were changed. I pray that for myself as well. God bless us, Lord, as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Learn to lead, God bless you.